Check one, sibilance, sibilance, check two. <laughs> Michael, take okay. Away. Hello. Uh, so we have a lot of things to cover, so I'm going to try to be very quick. Uh, quick introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a software developer with Rackspace. I've been doing OpenStack for uh, about 10 months, so I'm fairly new. Uh, I'm working in the uh, private cloud team. Uh, our product now is on uh, StackForge, or it's Ansible deployment, so feel free to check it out. Uh, I'm a member of the API working group. We're talking about that today. And I'm also a contributor, mostly at Heat, and a little bit of Horizon. Uh, also, on the side, I uh, do a lot of things with Flask. I uh, wrote the book uh, from O'Reilly on the framework and a bunch of other things. And I spoke in the last two PyCons about Flask and REST APIs. And I also have a blog. You're welcome to check it out. And I also blog on the Rackspace developer blog. And hi there, my name is Everett Taves. I'm a developer advocate also at Rackspace in our developer experience group. Uh, I helped found the API working group, which we'll get into a bit later with Jay Pipes and Chris Yeo. Also a Python OpenStack SDK contributor, and I've been working on OpenStack related technologies for the past three or four years, pretty, pretty close to uh, its inception. I write and speak as well and I write more on blogs and such. So if you want to check out more detail, you can go right ahead. And we're going to be sharing a link to this presentation at the end of the presentation, so you'll be able to follow up afterwards uh, with whatever you like. So I'll turn the, this first two thirds of the presentation over to Miguel. OK. So uh, I'm assuming uh, some of you, many of you, uh, will be writing applications that need to talk to an OpenStack cloud. So you have a lot of options. I'm going to give you an overview of those uh, options. So this is uh, pretty much a diagram where each of the color boxes are an entry point into the OpenStack cloud. So all these are options that you can, uh, you can take to, uh, to make the cloud do things. So as you can see, it's uh, fairly complicated. So I'm going to walk you through it one step at a time. So there you have your cloud, which is a bunch of services. right? You have Keystone, Nova, et cetera. Uh, some of them are optional. Some of them are core modules. So you have them there. And as you probably know, each of these modules has a REST API. So with one small ex exception that I mentioned in a little bit, it's very important to know that this is, I'm not sure people realize this, that everything that you do with the cloud they, it goes through these APIs. So this is it. So if, if it's not in the APIs, it cannot be done. Everything else on, on the full diagram that's on the left, it all goes through this. So this is the little exception that I mentioned. Uh, we also have AWS compatible APIs. We're not going to talk about those here, but I mean, you should know that they're there if, if you need to be uh, migrating from AWS. So. For each of the modules, there's also a Python client library that you uh, typically install with pip and basically wraps the corresponding REST API. And uh, you, you can use uh, functions or object-oriented programming to, uh, to talk to the cloud. Uh, in uh, recent times, uh, there, there was uh, this new project. It's called the OpenStack SDK. It tries to consolidate all these many uh, Python libraries that you need to use to talk to individual, individual uh, modules. And uh, if you use the OpenStack SDK, th this is a single library that talks to uh, many, most of the, uh, of the core modules in, uh, in the OpenStack cloud. So uh, the, uh, the OpenStack SDK goes through the same REST APIs, but it, it's a unified client. So. Uh, if you're using Python, you're golden. This is a, a fairly good option. But you know, Python is not the whole world. If, if you're not using Python, this is a no-go. I mean, as nice as the, uh, these options are, you know, they're, they're not for you. So um, there's also third-party clients. Uh, so these are unofficial clients uh, created by the community. Uh, this uh, expose the REST APIs, wrappers to the REST APIs for, uh, for different languages and platforms. Uh, you may find something that works for you. 
uh, because they're unofficial, they usually lag behind the, uh, the support that's uh, obviously in the REST APIs, but also in the Python clients, which are official. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, it's sort of a hit or miss situation with this. So uh, going even higher level now, uh, we have the command line clients. So each module also offers a command line client. And note that in, in the diagram, I drew boxes around the Python library and the Python command line client. And the reason is that there's a very heavy coupling between these two. They're actually the same package. So you, you install both together. They're the same Python package. So uh, these uh, give you access uh, from the command line. You can use this, exercise the REST API through the Python client from the command line. Now, uh, like the same effort that was done uh, with the OpenStack SDK on the library side, uh, it was also thought that it, it was kind of cumbersome to have all these many command line clients, uh, different command line clients. So there's also an effort here to uh, consolidate all the clients into a single command line application. And that, that's called the OpenStack command line client. And for some reason, I'm yet to understand, it doesn't go through the OpenStack SDK, at least not yet. It goes through the individual uh, Python clients, the client libraries. And uh, OK, so, so one of the problems with uh, the, the, the Python clients, uh, command line clients, are very useful to do uh, scripting. So you, you can stick them in bash scripts, and it's super easy to use. Unfortunately, if you need to do something a little bit more involved, uh, where, for example, you need the output of one command and uh, use some of that on the next command, then uh, you have to do crazy things like uh, parsing or scraping the output, which is uh, made for human consumption, not for scripts. So, you know, for very simple things, good option, something a little more involved, not, not so much. The, uh, the final client that we have is Horizon, the dashboard. And the dashboard also goes through the individual uh, Python uh, libraries, the, the Python clients. And of course, uh, this is uh, great if you need to do something quick manually, uh, but, you know, automation is not there. You, you can't use it for anything that, that's really building a, a workflow. So uh, my job here is try to convince you that the REST APIs are the best option. I I'm going to try. I I'm going to tell you good things and bad things about them. Uh, but let me start with a quick introduction. Uh, a lot of people you know, that, that, not, that don't work with APIs you know, every day, uh, they think REST API is one word. Uh, and, and really, there are many types of APIs, and REST is one type. And the, the main thing with REST is that it's an architecture that enables services to be highly scalable. So th that, that's the main thing with REST APIs. And uh, the interaction with the REST API works pretty much in the same way you interact with a uh, web server through, uh, through a web browser, like browsing Twitter or Facebook, that kind of thing. Uh, basically, the client sends a request, and the server responds, and with that response, the client uh, gets some information, makes a new request, and so on. And it's, uh, it's conceptually extremely simple. That's why I like it so much. Uh, I, I think it's underrated. Uh, REST APIs that are well implemented, there's a lot of common knowledge that applies to all of them, uh, even outside of OpenStack. So uh, you don't have to go to the manual so much when you know that the framework is a REST API. So uh, there's a lot of things that are uh, known in advance. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about REST. I, I get carried away every time I start talking about REST. Uh, but I gave a talk last month uh, at PyCon in Montreal. So uh, it's called, Is Your REST API RESTful? Uh, it's on uh, YouTube, so search for that if, if you want to know. Uh, in, in that talk, I described the, the six uh, principles of REST in detail, and I gave a demonstration with the Python uh, API. So feel free to look at that. So I'm a good news first kind of guy. So, uh, and also, the good part is shorter, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> well, so let's get, get this out of the way. Uh, the main, most important thing about the REST APIs is that they're universal. You can access them from anywhere as long as you have an HTTP client. You don't need a library. You don't need a command line client. You don't need anything. 
HTTP client is all you need. You can access the REST APIs fully. All the options are available to you uh, with no restrictions. So that means your phone can talk to OpenStack. Uh, uh, a mi microcontroller uh, with an Ethernet stack can talk to, uh, to an OpenStack cloud. So it's available everywhere. So if, if you need to remember one thing about this talk, I think it's this. This is very important. So uh, now, specifically about the way the OpenStack APIs are organized, uh, one thing that I think is very nice is that we have all these modules, and uh, you, you can combine them uh, to build clouds that uh, have uh, different features so that they're, they're uh, uh, specifically designed for a purpose. So uh, probably the, the core modules are going to be always there, but then you can add and remove uh, all of these other uh, components. To, uh, to make the cloud that, uh, that's uh, specifically designed for, for uh, your purposes. So uh, since you have clouds that may have different, uh, different shapes and forms, uh, one thing that I think it's also very good is that there's this concept of the catalog. Uh, so uh, when you start talking to an OpenStack cloud, you, you have access to the catalog. And the catalog is a list of all the services that are available. And for each service, you get the, uh, the main URL, the endpoint, to start talking to that service. So basically, uh, you only need to know how to initiate the connection to the cloud, and then uh, you get back the catalog. And you, you don't have to hard code anything in your application. If you want to talk to Nova, in fact, I, I don't even know what, what port Nova is. I don't remember, because I never need to know that. Because I, I go to the catalog, or my, my application goes to the catalog and gets the URL from there, and the port is there. So I, I, I don't need to remember that, and that, that's very good. Uh, this is one of the pillars of the REST architecture. You can see it in my PyCon talk. It's called Hypermedia. So I, th I think this is a very nice implementation of Hypermedia. Uh, so uh, the authentication flow is also very good. It's very straightforward. It works the same for all the modules. So once you learn this, uh, you basically, you're good to go. We, you can talk to any OpenStack services. Basically, your application needs to know the authentication URL. So uh, in the same way, when you, uh, when you go to Twitter uh, to check your, uh, your stream, the only thing you need to remember is that you need to type twitter.com. You, you don't remember all the other URLs are inside Twitter. Uh, for OpenStack, you need to know the authentication URL. So that, that's your entry point into the cloud. So you send your credentials. And OpenStack will send you back the, uh, the catalog and an access token. Then you find whatever you want to do uh, in the catalog, whatever service you need to talk to. And you start sending requests directly to that service using the endpoint that came in the catalog, Not, nothing that you need to hard code or know in advance. And uh, for every request, you have to pass your token. And, and that module will know who you are. So it's very simple to explain, and it's actually very simple to do. It's, it, it's, it's a great thing. OK, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with the good. <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of bad things. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll get started. <laughs> I don't know. You, you probably know about this. Uh, we, we seem to be version happy, kind of version happy in, in OpenStack. Uh, uh, basically, releasing a new version of an API fixes a lot of problems. So the, the, we have too many, in my opinion. Uh, and it, it, it's really confusing. Uh, what I would like to see in the future, and, and Everett and I and, and the API working group are working on this, uh, is that uh, we uh, basically change the design of these APIs so they are evolvable, so that uh, you as a client know that not all the things that you get from the API you will understand, because the API is constantly evolving. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be broken. It means that anything that you don't understand, you ignore. And the things that you understand are there, and they're always the same. So uh, I would like that. That it, We're quite a ways from, from this right now. So uh, this is, I, I put an example. I, I, I said I work on heat, and th this, this gives me heat a lot. Uh, uh, many times, uh, and I, I hope if you, if you write a client, you don't do this. Uh, this, this is a bad example. Many times uh, you find that uh, the catalog is incomplete. The catalog doesn't have really all there is in, in, this, in the cloud. 
And this is a good example. Uh, Keyst, uh, heat uh, needs to use Keystone V3. So uh, this is actually today in, in Heat. Uh, heat goes and reads the authentication URI from the config file, steals it from Keystone, and, and then it does a replace of V2 with V3, hoping that V3 will be there. Uh, so th this is wrong in so many levels that I, I don't even have time to explain. And, <laughs> and I, I'm hoping that uh, for liberty, this, this is gone. I mean, I, I quit if it's not, probably. <laughs> Uh, and, and we in, uh, in the uh, OSID, the, uh, the Stack for, for Ansible deployment, uh, we have to, uh, to keep this. Basically, we, we make an exception to make this work. Because right now, if we wanted to uh, do a full Keystone V3 deployment, this would be broken. Uh, another really big thing that goes on is that the client and the servers, and by client I mean the Python clients, are heavy coupled. And the main reason for that is that uh, there's one team for each module, and that team works uh, you know, end to end on the, uh, on the actual server, the API, the, uh, the Python client, and the command line client. It, they're all fixed you know, at the same time. So uh, it's really inevitable that uh, there are some uh, bad things going on in the server that are compensated for in the client. So when you come through the API and you're bypassing the client, then you, you find these weird things. Uh, so that, that, that's very common. Uh, part of the problem is that uh, th there's uh, an emphasis in testing all these modules through the Python client. Uh, the testing through, uh, directly through the REST API is, is, is less. There's not so much coverage. So uh, we, we need to improve that. Uh, remember I said that uh, the catalog was a great implementation of hypermedia. Unfortunately, when you start talking to individual servers, uh, there, there's no hypermedia or the hypermedia implementation is not that good. So uh, you, uh, as a client, may be forced to hard code URLs for different things. You're going to have to go look in the docs, what the URLs are for different resources, and then hard code them. And I have two examples here from a Glance on the left and Nova on the right. And you can see that they, they hard code uh, URLs uh, they, they don't hard code the, the catalog portion, but they hard code the right, the right part. Uh, the glance one is specifically interesting. It even hard codes the version number. So that code will break when, uh, when there's a version change. So not good. I mean, if, if, if it's in your power, then do this. Uh, th these are the official clients, by the way. So I, I, ideally, I'd like to see this fixed there, too. But we'll see. Uh, another thing that uh, fairly common and uh, gives me sleepless nights is the, these, uh, these actions concept that's so common in, in so many of the APIs. Uh, and uh, the REST architecture says that everything is resource-based. So you talk to a resource, and the actions are uh, predetermined. The actions are part of the REST uh, structure. You, you can do uh, CRUD-type uh, actions, so create, read, update, and delete. Uh, so uh, the URLs uh, represent, should represent resources. And here you see that uh, some of the APIs abuse that and start putting actions in the URLs. So these are more things that you need to hard code if you're writing an application. Uh, some are, are really bad. The, the second one in the heat portion, it, it's actually, I mean, if, if you can tell me what it does, I mean, what, what is it validating? I have no idea, right? I mean, you, you have to go read the code. Or, or, or the documentation to find out exactly what, what's, uh, what's doing. So it's also something that I hope uh, will improve over time. Uh, remember I said that uh, the APIs have universal access. I sort of lied a little bit. There's a tiny lie there. Uh, browsers are special, probably in a different universe, <laughs> not in this one. Uh, so uh, that universal uh, qualification doesn't apply to browsers. Uh, they have uh, strict security requirements. So when you are running a web application that's based on, say, website A, uh, the JavaScript that comes from that application cannot talk to any services outside of that website A because of security, right? They, they basically want a secure environment. Uh, that's called uh, CORS. It's uh, cross-origin request sharing. Uh, so CORS is a method that you can use to enable the browsers to do that, to talk to different uh, services. But the, uh, 
the trick there is that that, that third-party service, in this case it would be the OpenStack services, should need to green light that exchange. So if you connect to website A for an application and then that application loads in your browser and wants to talk to OpenStack, OpenStack needs to say, okay, website A is allowed to talk to me. And that, that, that hasn't been implemented in any modules except Swift, which by the way has a very nice implementation. But, uh, but none of the others have this, so you, you, you can't do it. So if, if, if you Google this, you're gonna find some people that hacked the uh, services to an enable course uh, in, uh, manually. You just need to just mock with config files and stuff. Uh, the method that I prefer that I, I always use is to use an API proxy. So I, I put a, an API proxy in my website A, and I send everything to that proxy. And if, if you're interested, uh, hit me you know, on Twitter or whatever, and I have a proxy that I'm, I'm uh, very happy to share. It's written in Flask, as you can guess. Uh, so, and then I have a, a bunch of slides here for inconsistencies. This, this is a big theme we, in the API working group. We, we want things to be consistent, and they're not. So uh, pagination is one of the worst offenders, in my view. I think I counted four different uh, methods to do pagination, uh, going from not able to, so not implemented, to three different implementations, which I show here. Uh, they're slightly different, so wh when you're working with these uh, with services, you have to be aware of uh, you know what what implementation they have. They're, they're all different, uh, th and they also don't have hypermedia. So ideally, you want pagination to uh, give you links to next and previous pages. No, none of that is implemented. So hopefully, this will improve. Uh, filtering and sorting are two other areas where uh, implementations vary or they're non-existent. So the experience, it, it's, it's different depending on which service you talk to, same as uh, with pagination. Uh, metadata is a topic that we talk a lot in the API working group. And here we have uh, most of the implementations are sort of consistent or close enough, but Swift uses something that's abysmally different. So we, we have to be aware of that. Uh, And another one, uh, this is the direct result of uh, the APIs not getting enough testing. Uh, since this is all going through HTTP, a big thing with the, uh, the interactions are the, the responses that you get, which have these uh, uh, status codes that are from the HTTP specification. And depending on the service, the same type of operation will give you a different response code. So your client cannot generically uh, you know, a write code that uh, acts depending on those responses. And examples are uh, asynchronous uh, requests, which uh, many, uh, many services respond with 200, which is a code for okay. Uh, but the correct one for, for that type of thing will be a 202. And likewise, uh, you know, a couple other things. So, so, you know, it's something that you need to be aware of. You're gonna have to uh, be flexible for, for the time being and uh, support different types of uh, responses and uh, know how to react to them. So uh, I'm gonna end there with the, uh, the bad stuff and now uh, Everett is gonna tell us how uh, we're gonna solve the problem. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah. Right, so what are we gonna do about it? We've got some good, lots of bad. We need to do something about it, right? So our solution is the API working group. And this is a bunch of words on a slide. Uh, I realize that. But go ahead and take a few seconds to, to read the whole thing, because it took us like a month to put together these two sentences, because that's how we do. So the gist of it is you know, we want to improve the developer experience for those people using the API. The, we're really concerned with the API and up. So all of those people who are actually using the API to build their applications and to operate their applications on OpenStack. The implementation stuff and down underneath the API, that's out of scope for us. We're concerned about the API and up and all of the people who are using it in one way or another. And we would like to look at this holistically so that when people come to an OpenStack cloud, wherever it may be, they're presented with a platform that actually works together as a coordinated set of services, a coherent set of services, 
that looks like they were all developed by a group of people who are actually working together. In fact, they are, but the communication and the consistency between them could be much better, and that's what we're here to help with. And we'd also like to improve the design, a lot of these APIs, while we're at it. Some of the design choices were made uh, maybe in, in simple ignorance. Uh, they weren't aware of the particular REST principle behind some decision that they could have made better. So we're here to inform them of that aspect, too. There's a, a very big educational aspect to what the API working group does. And so we go ahead and we create these guidelines that live in this repo and get published as documentation on specs.openstack.org. And we go out into the world, into OpenStack land, and you know, promote convergence of all the APIs of all the different services around this set of guidelines. Whether people are creating new features for an existing API, or whether they're creating the next version of their API. So I'm really focused on the deliverables in the API working group. I actually want us to do something and not just talk about guidelines and, and create them, and hopefully one day somebody follows them. Uh, I want there to be some hard deliverables for us. Uh, the first being actually taking uh, and doing some analysis of the existing APIs, going through, you know, say, Nova, Cinder, Glance, Neutron, and what do all of their errors look like across all of those different services? Are they the same? Where are they different? Is there any similarity at all? The answer is no. So we need to improve that, but we need to know where we are right now before we can do so. Then we go ahead and we create the guidelines. This can vary from a simple paragraph on, you know, return this status code when you're doing an asynchronous create. Very simple, very short, to much more complex guidelines around tagging of various resources or consistent errors across all the different servers or services. Now, reviews are kind of where we put the rubber on the road. This is, this is the idea behind reviews. So not only do we review our own guidelines within the API working group, because we want to make sure we have good quality guidelines that are themselves consistent, but when people actually are writing API impacting code for those various services, so they're off in their own repos, their own projects, they're doing their own thing all over the place. But the one thing that brings it together that lets us know that they're actually writing code that will impact the API is this API impact flag that they can add to their code commits. So they write in their, their code commit comment, API impact, and then we're able to discover that review and realize that there's actually some code out there that's going to impact the API. And it could be just a, a, a specification, some, a plan to write some code that's going to impact the API, or it's actually code being written to impact the API. So we'll get a, a list, essentially a report in Garrett of all of these things, uh, all these reviews that are going on, and we'll go out and see basically how well that code or that spec is actually following the guidelines or if there is even a guideline to follow for that API impacting code. And then, if it follows it, plus one. There's the caret, right? You say, plus one, good job, you followed the guideline, you know, have a plus one. <laughs> Eff it, have a plus one, right? If it doesn't follow the guideline, then you can say, you know what, there's actually a rule written about this. And it's over in this uh, repo here. I can link to it very specifically. And you know you should probably follow it, because then you'll be consistent with all of the other services across OpenStack. And you, know, you put a minus one on there, because you'd like them to follow the guideline. So there's your stick. So this is kind of where the, the rubber ultimately meets the road. And we can actually get some traction within these various projects. And because we're dealing with all of the projects across OpenStack, ideally. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration with the cross-project liaisons. These are people within those projects who are dedicated to you know, integrating with the API working group and talking to us and, and keeping tabs on what we're doing. And then there's IRC meetings and, and the mailing list, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Many ways to communicate. And bugs, question mark. Uh, so what does that mean? So one, one other deliverable we may have is when a service, you know, an API of a service isn't following a particular guideline, we go out 
to that project, go to their bug page and say, oh, you're not following a particular guideline. That's a bug. Please fix it in the next version of your, of your API. Now, whether that's a good idea or not, I'm not actually sure. I'd love to hear feedback on that, because to me, that feels a little bit like declaring war. And I don't know that that's a good way to get people on board and actually get them to follow your guidelines. On the other hand, it could be a way to inform them that their API is out of whack with the guidelines, and they would actually appreciate receiving that bug so that they can do something about it in the next version. We'll see how it goes. We got a lot of traction in Kilo. This is really just a handful of quotes from people who have been interacting with us in the API working group. I know there, there's a lot, many more instances of this sort of thing. Uh, John Garbutt, the Nova PTL, discovered Miguel's guideline for tagging just as they were implementing tagging in Nova. And he was happy, grateful to see it. Excellent. I, you've created this thing. I can reuse a ton of this work. You've saved me a lot of time. We're going to be more consistent across all these different services. Salvatore from a Neutron Core wanted our feedback on some microversion stuff in Neutron. Rocky in the logging working group is working on creating better logging error messages across all the different services. I'm working on a guideline for improving the errors across all the different APIs. The key piece between those two is like sub-error codes. So if you've got error codes in the logs, sometimes, oftentimes, you're going to want to see that same error code in your API. So there's a connection point there. So we're working to actually make that consistent, too. So when it comes to getting an error in the API, you can actually correlate that with an error in the log and fix your problems much faster for your users, improve that developer experience, shorten that time to fixing problems in your cloud. And this last one here is of particular instance, uh, interest, sorry, for me. Alex from uh, Nova came to us and, and joined our group. And he and uh, Matthew Gilliard have been working with Jay Pipes on a new model for interacting with the working group. And so as they're working on the Nova API and they're doing something new or doing something different, they're going to come to the working group guidelines and see if there's something there that covers it. If it's not there, it's on them to actually create something, to engage with us and create a guideline for that new thing that they want to do in their API or that simply isn't covered yet in a, a guideline that's already there. And so we'll go ahead and review it and create a guideline for it and then use that to inform the original development that they were doing in the first place. So I think this is a great model for working with all of the different services, all the different OpenStack projects out there in terms of how we can actually get more traction within the API working group with the different projects. And I'd love to see more of it. So this wouldn't be a OpenStack session without saying pull requests are accepted. Uh, if you're interested in helping out, if you care about the APIs, which is to say if you use OpenStack, you care about the APIs, whether you know it or not, because all of those different surfaces that Miguel talked about to the left of the API, all of that stuff depends on the foundation of the API. And if the API is crap, it's going to bubble up as bugs and inconsistencies and, and wonky errors in the rest of those layers. So believe me, you, you care about the API. You can meet with us on IRC, chat with us on the OpenStack development mailing list, or in the hallway here, or on Twitter. However you want to give us feedback, give us feedback, please. Uh, I've actually already learned a, a bunch of great things just by chatting with people at the summit these first two days. We have a session at 3.40 just upstairs. Uh, if you've got access to the design summit, uh, you can follow this link to take you to the uh, design Summit sked page for it. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, this is Miguel. I'm Everett. That's the one link you need to write down or remember if, if you care to follow up, the rack.to good, bad APIs. And I'm contractually uh, obligated to ask you or mention that we are hiring uh, 
people of all natures in Rackspace, developers, um, you know, ops people, sales, marketing, business, haha, like bring it on. Come visit us in the booth or, or you can hit up this link at the bottom here. Thank you very much. Thank you.